Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we will have a slight modification because, unfortunately, Frank Kuhn had to run away after his presentation. So the second moderator will be uh, Sengul Ozdek from uh, Ankara in uh, Turkey. So uh, we would like to thank the SOE organizers to invite us to present our session. And uh, this uh, session is intitulated uh, Peeling the ILM in Macular Surgery, a Surgical Necessity that Deals with Side Effects. First, macular peeling have been attempted in the late 80s for a wide range of pathologies like macular pucker, eparitinal membranes, macular holes, and success rate have uh, always been interesting regarding their primary cause, uh, particularly visual acuity, fundus appearance, OCT contour, and macular sickness all respond well to surgery. As an example, one et al. demonstrated a clear reduction of the inner retinal sickness and volume after ILM peeling uh, in idiopathic epiretinal membranes. However, in epiretinal membranes secondary to another pathology like diabetes, vascular thrombosis, or uveitis, as an example, uh, results are frequently tempered by uh, the original cause. As an example, Gassemi et al. did not observe significant improvement in best corrected visual acuity in a series of non-tractional epiretinal membrane with refractory diabetic macular edema. Was it due to the fact that the cause uh, was not tractional, meaning that the surgery uh, do not have a place in such situation, or that our retinal tissue were already dying, meaning that in some situations we need to be earlier in surgery, in surgery, or was it simply related to the trauma induced to the retina when we were peeling the ILM? Uh, or in other words, are we insulting the retina when peeling the ILM? It will be the question of the day. Meyer et al. demonstrated some signs of trauma to the retina when peeling the ILM, but they attributed this uh, trauma to a direct uh, contact with uh, the forceps. But uh, I would like to briefly uh, show you some uh, uh, results uh, from my team. We are still working on this, but uh, it's preliminary results. When we see such images here, uh, and uh, we correlated our uh, OCT images with our videos of uh, surgery, you definitely see uh, the exact place where ILM has been removed, okay? It is a place, as we call, of a fracture. And fracture in physics means we are creating elong elongations. On soft materials like the retina, it's, uh, it's a, a tricky situation because we don't know so much uh, how the tissues are responding. But definitely here, one year after surgery, you see that we, are, we have a thinning of the retina and we have some uh, modifications at the edge of uh, the fracture of the ILM. So uh, the good question would be to know if uh, it's, uh, we are not creating an assault on the ganglion cell bundles uh, when we are removing the ILM. So one good question would be to know if we must peel the ILM or simply remove the epiretinal membrane. Uh, many groups demonstrated that peeling the ILM is worsening the visual acuity, microperimetry, and uh, uh, ERGs. Uh, whereas other groups uh, find an interest in uh, peeling the ILM and do not report trauma or uh, without consequences. And all these questions are also mandatory for macular hole surgeries. Indeed, some recent studies, uh, but not all, reported some signs of trauma due to ILM peeling. This probably means that some team do not measure trauma or overcome it. So the true question of the day would be how to recognize in our statistics the uh, ILM peeling related trauma and how to reduce it if possible. Now, Ferenc Kuhn will talk about ILM removal in diabetic macular edema. So, after hearing the dangers, let me talk about what I do. 
So usually what we want in medicine is, is base our practice on uh, evidence, uh, which means basically this. We have a disease which is getting more and more common. And as we know, diabetic macular edema is the number one cause in, of blindness in this disease. So you do as much a control over the systemic condition as possible. You do laser. And then as treatment options, we have, of course, injections and implants. This is the theory. In reality, this is what happens. So my question is, what's wrong with this? And I listed only five here because we don't have time for more. The first is the statistics, which, as we know, can be twisted in any way to prove anything you want to be proven. I will give you just two very quick examples how it can mislead you. First, you have a computer and you feed the following information into the computer. I had vodka with water and I got drunk. I had wine with vod uh, water and I got drunk. And I had whiskey with water and I got drunk. So what will the computer tell you is that vodka is fine, but don't drink water because that was the common thread among all three. The second problem is if you accept the study blindly. In other words, you eliminate your brain from the process. So here's a question. Should you open the parachute if you jump out of an airplane at 1,000 meters? Because can we have the sound? Yes. So we know that bad things can happen even if you do open the parachute. Uh, but do we have evidence that it works? And indeed, the British Medical Journal a few years ago published a question whether it makes sense to open the parachute. And the answer was, we don't have a study to show that it works. So we should have a double-blind, randomized, placebo-controlled crossover trial to see if it's worth opening or not. So the problem with these studies is that you look at the tree, but you don't look at the forest. Because we are not dealing in this case with a sick tissue. It's not even a sick eyeball, it's a person. So what you have to imagine now is you are the patient and you go in and you have an injection and your visual acuity, of course, goes up until a few weeks later, it goes down again. So now we go and get another injection. And here is the next issue then, the cost of it, because somebody has to pay for this. So, and I just want to tell you that a few days ago, I heard about a patient who received 81 injections. So in three years, what you do is you take this Mercedes and place it inside the vitreous cavity. And here is a list of the cost of some of these medications. And I just want to remind you of the CAT study, which a few years ago basically showed that the drug that costs 100 times more than the other one is pretty much has the same efficiency but the cost of the study to prove this is over $50 million. And then the question is, which of the companies rushed to finance that study? And of course, none. So now the question is, which company will sponsor a study to compare medication with surgery? What is surgery? Well, I'll come back to that in a second, and I'm going to skip these slides of the technique because we are a little bit late. But certainly, I agree that if you do ILM peeling on a diabetic patient, your technique has to be different from peeling the ILM in an eye that has an otherwise normal retina. So a couple of things I want to emphasize. The first is you have to be very slow much slower than your normal ILM peeling would be. And the angle at which you peel to reduce the, the trauma that you are going to affect on the retina, you have to move your forceps pretty much parallel to the retina. So not lift up, but move parallel. And we can talk about, if we have time, uh, about how to grab 
the tissue, and I fully agree with you that you always have to avoid the macular bundle because you don't want to create more problem than you already have. But I just very recently had a, a fellow of mine to look at some recent results. And you can see that with a single surgery, it's a 91% permanent drying, with 72% of eyes having at least three snell lines of improvement. And one of the other beauties of vitrectomy is that this is a process that if it did not work, you can still continue with your injection. So the question then is why this surgery is not done more often? And the answer is here. So I, I spent a lot of time to find out what the studies show. And you can see the numbers here. Uh, this is the actual numbers of studies that really looked at the treatment of diabetic macular edema. And you can see here that surgery was used in 1% of these studies. On the left, and I promise I will not read this to you, these are all the things that have been tried. And everything on the left-hand side has been standardized all the way to the size of the nurse who will bring the injection cannula to you. My vitrectomy is not standardized. In other words, mouse and mouse are the same thing. So, <coughs> uh, this is one problem with all the studies. The second one is usually when they say vitrectomy, it is the last resort. Nothing else works. So net, now let's try surgery. And my experience over the many, many years that I have been operating on eyes with this condition is that if you do it early and you do it properly, which means ideally you give an injection preoperatively, so by the time you do your surgery, uh, the macula is dry, uh, your results are much better. So uh, again, there are certain things that we all do or should do in, in uh, dealing with these patients, which is uh, systemic control. And we try to do as atraumatic in surgery as possible. But the message is to do this early and not when everything else fails. And we have to pay attention to all the details. And I know that today this is heresy, what I said, because we switched from being surgeons to injectionists. But I think even then we must not give up thinking uh, and have a concept before we act. Honey, <laughs> what are you doing? Thank you very much. Thank you, Ferenc. Uh, for very attractive presentation. Um, I, uh, is there any question from the floor? If not, I would like to ask you one more. Um, actually, I was, I was also doing uh, vitrectomy as a last resort, but after the results of uh, European Vitreoretinal Society macular edema study, which have shown that uh, macular uh, edema is quite very well treated with vitrectomy, then I think we have to change our uh, way towards vitrectomy. So um, do you have any uh, suggestion, any other suggestion in eyes with uh, very sticky ILM? Uh, it's because this is very prevalent in diabetic eyes. Should we insist on doing uh, ILM peeling or we should just remove the uh, posterior hyaloid and leave it alone just not to be too, so traumatic? Uh, it's a very, very, very good question. I, I do not have comparison data. I can tell you what my experience has been over the many, many years that I have been doing this. The ILM is indeed different in these eyes. It's thicker and usually it's more adherent. I remember one case where I counted how many times I had to go back and re-grab it and I stopped counting at 36. So it is not the same, as I said, as an eye with an, a normal retina. But what that tells you uh, is that if this is an ILM that is indeed different uh, in, in behavior and anatomy 
from the ILM that you see in other diseases, maybe it is part of the problem. So I do think that it is important to remove it. I also remove it in a fairly large area. Uh, and again, my numbers so far, uh, I'm, I'm very confident in saying this, uh, prove that for the patient, it should be an option that is offered as opposed to going to, to inject you know, every month or whatever period for the foreseeable future. I do not make the decision for my patients, and I want to emphasize this. I will not tell the patient, okay, I'm gonna do surgery on you. What I will do is I explain the options and give numbers and let the patient decide. Thank you very much. Antonio? Can I, yes, perfect. Uh, my question is more technical. Um, if it happens that you know you have to do surgery when there is a macular edema because it's refractory to anti-VGF, and there are you know large, there is a large, large foveal cyst. Yes. Do you still peel the ILM or do you do a foveal spearing? No, peeling? I do peel the ILM, and I, I don't know how well it was shown on the video. This. The case I selected to show you was one with a huge cyst in the fovea. So over the many, many, many cases I have done, I remember two cases when I did rupture the cyst. And you see it very nicely because when you do that, you have a little of a schlieren, so the, the fluid is very viscous and you will see that uh, intraoperatively. So I think, again, if you are careful with your technique, in the vast majority of the cases, you will be able to avoid rupturing the cyst. Okay, please. Jerry Sabag from Southern California. Nice presentation, and there is ample biochemical evidence to support the fact that both the posterior vitreous cortex and the inner limiting membrane in diabetic patients are affected by advanced glycation end products, and so there is scientific basis to your observation and our observation that this tissue is very different. Having said that, aged individuals also have advanced glycosylation of the proteins at the vitreoretinal interface. And so my question is, have you extrapolated to treating patients with AMD in the same early vitrectomy paradigm as you have in diabetic patients? Well, it's a very good point, and nobody knows more about this than you do. So my only, my only comment is, is that I do have a, a fi a quite a number of patients who have AMD, and I did surgery for various reasons. If they have an epimacular membrane, I will peel the ILM. Uh, if they don't, I usually don't because uh, of the risk of, of uh, thinning the, the retina that is left behind but I cannot give you an answer because I did not look at, at those patients separately. But after this question, I will. <laughs> I can answer maybe uh, a part of it. Uh, I have done some uh, vitrectomy for AMD cases, uh, wet AMD cases, when they have some vitromacular adhesion, not traction, but adhesion, uh, maybe almost seven, eight years ago. Uh, just if they were unresponsive to anti-VEGF or uh, suboptimal response is get, but I couldn't get any uh, change after vitrectomy, I can say. And we have done another study on AMD cases who has uh, epiretinal membrane associated with uh, choroidal neovascularization. Uh, we have um, compared the results with those who do not have any epiretinal membrane we have seen that those with epiretinal membranes are more resistant. They need more injections, and the injection interval is uh, much less in those cases. That's all I can say. And there are several studies that support exactly what you just described, um, plus the lack of a response that you alluded to earlier may be exactly what he said a few moments ago, is because you're waiting to use it as the last resort as opposed to earlier in the natural history of the disease. All right, thank you, Dr. Sebak. Thank you. So next speaker is uh, Sengul Öztek from uh, Ankara in Turkey, and uh, she will uh, speak about uh, the free flap technique. 
Thank you very much. Thank you, Philip, for bringing us together in EVRS Symposium. Uh, I will talk about free island flap technique for complicated macular hole cases. You know that we have really high success rates uh, in standard primary non-complicated cases, over 90%, uh, with only vitrectomy and island peeling, and mostly with gas, sometimes even with air. But uh, however, we have lower success rates in complicated cases, like in persistent macular hole cases, or large holes with atrophic uh, ages, uh, like long-standing and traumatic cases, and in holes associated with pathologic myopia and retinal detachment ca cases. So this is my first case to share with you. Uh, he was a 65-year-old male patient. He had long-standing macular hole, more than two years of uh, uh, period, and visual acuity was quite low. And I started with, uh, there was also an epiretinal membrane. You see the negative staining of the uh, ILM there. I started with vitrectomy, uh, ILM peeling and membrane peeling, but uh, ILM was very sticky. Uh, just I could take only uh, pieces of, uh, some pieces of uh, ILM. And uh, I tried another technique like whole aspiration under PFCL and massaging of the edges of the, uh, the macular hole and aspirating the fluid in between, like this, with 39 gauge uh, cannula. So this is a technique uh, suggested by Dr. Karabash from Turkey, my colleague. So when you do that massaging under PFCL and aspirating the, uh, uh, the uh, fluid in, in the hole under PFCL, so uh, you see the closure of the hole even during the surgery. This usually helps in such cases, but uh, as you see here, uh, it didn't work for this case. And uh, after resorption of the gas, the hole was still there. So I tried another technique. I, I should find another technique for this. Uh, I did the second surgery with free ILM flap technique. Uh, as you see here, I did the same thing as the first surgery in the second one. The, do, did the uh, aspiration and massaging technique again. And I harvested a small ILM. Uh, from uh, the periphery and uh, put it into the hole uh, under PFCL. Uh, it's important to use PFCL in these maneuvers because otherwise you can't manipulate the free, very tiny free ILM flap. And uh, I could close the macular hole at the end and uh, you see the evolution of the closure. After first surgery, you see it was opened, but the, after the second one, the vision also improved in the second surgery. And with long term, again, still we could reach a very good visual acuity level. This was the second case, a young lady with, re with a retinal dystrophy and uh, she had traumatic macular hole associated total retinal detachment. As you see here, the uh, posterior hyaloid was tightly attached and I couldn't remove the posterior hyaloid totally. Uh, I couldn't reach even to the equatorial area. As you see here, there were some pigmented uh, plaques there. So uh, if I insist, then it will cause retinal break formation. So I could uh, separate uh, to some point and stopped there, then started to peel ILM. And since it was a retinal detachment uh, associated macular hole and also there was RPE atrophy, so I decided to put ILM uh, flap again. For this case, I, I thought it can increase the, uh, the success rate. So as you see here, it's uh, easy to manipulate under PFCL. Otherwise, it's almost impossible. I had to do a posterior retinotomy because I couldn't peel the uh, posterior hyaluronic till the periphery. Otherwise, I would prefer to do the internal range from the periphery. But, but you should be insistent on uh, draining the uh, peripheral fluid first before taking the PFCL out. Otherwise, the, the fluid, remaining fluid, will cause uh, dislodgement of the island flap. 
And we could again see the uh, closure of this uh, case, which you know the prognosis where the prognosis may be a bit guarded. And you can see that the RP is is really damaged uh, because of retinal dystrophy. And uh, this is my third case. Uh, she was a very young lady with acute uh, myeloid leukemia, and uh, she had a counting finger level uh, vision in the left eye, and uh, her blood uh, level uh, anemia, thrombocytopenia, um, so no, general status was really bad, and uh, she had subfoveal and intraretinal hemorrhages at the beginning. That was uh, five years ago, and uh, this was the evolution of the case during my follow-up. Because of the general status, we couldn't operate her. As you can see, we, just, we could just follow. There was hemorrhage, then uh, lysis of hemorrhage, and it ended up with formation of a retinal uh, macular hole associated with, again, retinal pigment epithelial atrophy. And this was in 2015, three years after. You see a large hole associated with a large RPE atrophy area. So there was also an epiretinal membrane. So I decided to do the standard surgery first in those years. I, I wouldn't do that in uh, these years, but uh, after the first standard surgery, the hole didn't close as I was ex expecting, actually, I was afraid of that. And still it was there, no epiretinal membrane, but the macular hole was there. So I had to do another thing. So I planned a uh, free island flap technique. As you see, I could uh, achieve closure of the macular hole. And you can see the, uh, the whole area with this video. And the last case was a very small macular hole with vitromacular traction, and I was expecting a very good prognosis for this case. I did just a standard vitrectomy, ILM peeling, but the hole did not close. You know, sometimes it happens. And uh, after, then I had to do a, a reoperation with a hinged free flap technique. This, is the, this makes the uh, manipulation much easier. As you see here, when you relieve one end, you put it into the macular hole area, and you relieve the other end so that it doesn't move freely. It's, uh, the manipulations are much easier with this technique, and you have to be insistent on, again, uh, taking the fluid around the PFCL first, and then a PFCL so that you don't uh, lose the uh, free ILM flap. You, I don't lie it over the hole, but into the hole, as you see here. And you can see that the hole could uh, be closed after surgery. But I think I, I have made a mistake because I have done many layers. I have put many layers there. I think it's better to put two or maybe at most three layers of ILM flap, uh, ILM flap. There. So we have done a study uh, with uh, our friends who have adopted the same technique with me, uh, and we have collected our data on just recurrent macular hole cases, uh, which were uh, still open after the first standard surgery. Uh, we have collected 11 cases, and uh, we could get 90% uh, success rate after this technique in for these recurrent cases. And we have published it in ophthalmic surgery lasers very recently. So as a conclusion, autologous ILM grafts may be an option in complicated macular hole cases like failed macular holes associated with retinal detachment, traumatic atrophic large holes, and pathologic myopia associated macular holes. And I would like to again uh, invite you to Florence for EVRS. And also, if you can't manage, uh, you may want to come to Mediterranean Retina Meeting in October in Sorrento. Thank you. So is there any question from the audience? Yes, Ms. Uh, Jerry? Very nice presentation. I am Thank curious you. to know, I saw very quickly at the end where you had the table of the number of months 
that transpired between the first operation and the second. There seemed to be two or three that were one month after the first procedure, but then many that were six, seven, and nine months. And the reason I ask is that studies in the monkey have shown that the ILM can regenerate, but it takes six months. And we published a series of patients in whom reoperation resulted in terrible vision with paracentral scotomata. And we studied the tissue and found positive staining for neurofilament on the material that was removed at the second operation. And OCTs showed thinning, and we believed that that was an optic atrophy that resulted from retinal damage, and concluded that it was only in the people who were done within a few months after the first operation, and none of the people who were done six months or longer after the first operation. So ever since that study, I don't reoperate in less than six months, and I'd be curious to know what your impression is and, and maybe some other people in the audience. Uh, actually, I don't have so uh, peculiar, well-formed uh, well impressions about this, but uh, what I do is I usually um, pretend to do it within three months, mostly, uh, because patients usually do not want to wait too long after, you know, a failure. Uh, they usually want to be operated as soon as possible and go on their, you know, social life. But I don't know anything else, but maybe um, some other colleagues may have some other ideas about that. Because it's difficult, you know, to wait six months more for people. Yes, I understand. Um, mm -hmm. But I think that what it really says is we need more data. And if we were able to integrate the amount of time between the first and second operation into our analysis, maybe we would learn something. Okay, thank you. Any other question? Yes, please. Thank you for the lovely presentation. I was wondering what was the visual outcome in your uh, third case, the, one, the woman with the leukemia? Ah. Uh, vision did not improve because of the RPA atrophy, but at least the, uh, the macular hole is closed so that it doesn't uh, become worse. But vision did not improve in that case. I'm trying to show that one. Any other question? Antonio, yes? I have a question. Just for the matter of discussion, you know, is there a um, maximum time, like I have had a hold for five years, 10 years, 15 mm -hmm. years, mm -hmm. that you would not offer surgery to your patients? Actually, previously, during my first years of vitreoretinal surgery, uh, we were not so willing to do these uh, macular hole cases after one year, if, if you know that it's more than one year. But uh, for now, I, I always try, just I give a chance uh, for the case just to try. I don't have any limit for that. Thank you. And you, Philippe, same? Uh, no, and I would like to ask the same question to the audience. Could I ask you uh, to raise your hand if you operate your patients when there is edema at the margins of the hole? I mean, from my, uh, from, uh, in my practice, I'm operating patients, uh, not uh, linking my patients with the time of the, this hole, but uh, I'm operating my patients when there is still some edema in the margins of uh, of uh, the whole, and uh, we, we do the same, not so much. I think atrophic ages are, Few, yeah. atrophic ages are a poor prognostic uh, finding, but still, um, uh, I think that was the case in uh, Sophia's presentation. Even if you have, you know, atrophic ages, and uh, that was the case in my third case, uh, with the ILM graft or flat technique, you have a basis for, you know, closure. So that's why in previous years with standard uh, surgery, so we couldn't close those holes. But now with the newer techniques, I think we have chance to close such even atrophic ones. Okay. I had an expertise of about 22 cases. Is a macular hole height 
was positively correlated with the anatomical and, fun and functional outcomes. Could the I edema at the edge of the hole, the more the uh, height of the lateral mm -hmm. hole edges, the better the prognostic value regardless the closure rate and the uh, functional outcome regardless the delta change in log mark visual acuity. Yeah, I agree with this you. is a well-known yeah, well parameter, thank you. But I think we have to be careful in using the term edema because yeah. these yeah. cystic yeah. spaces are actually tractional cysts. Fluorescein angiography does not show significant amounts of leakage to explain the presence of the cysts. So everything is correct, it's just that it's not really edema. It's just yeah. cystic spaces resulting from tangential traction. Completely agree. Yeah. Thank you. Now, um, Dr. Philippe Koch will present systematic gas injection at the end of epiretinal membrane removal to reduce the surgical trauma induced, induced during surgery. Yes, thank you. <coughs> so, as an introduction, um, Peeling the ILM seems necessary to avoid epiretinal membrane recurrences, as said uh, Antonio, and uh, as I already said. But it's uh, traumatizing the ganglion cell bundles and the retina, uh, leading sometimes to decreased visual acuity, uh, leading sometimes to a thickening of the retina postoperatively. And uh, few uh, studies report its uh, creation of macular holes following uh, ILM peeling, particularly in uh, CME, ILM peeling, uh, CME epiretinal membranes, cystoid macular uh, uh, edema epiretinal membranes, and in uh, vitromacular uh, tractions. Uh, so uh, in, uh, I will show you a study I performed between 2007 and 2011 uh, prospectively, and we followed our patients up to four years after surgery. And the idea was at that time to use gas, uh, SF6 gas, 0.4 uh, cc of pure SF6 gas, injected at the end of surgery, as a massage, as a tamponade, to try to uh, reduce the trauma induced during surgery. So uh, we try to in inject gas tamponade to counteract the perioperative elongation of the retinal fibers by massaging the macular area in the first postoperative days. So we were asking patients to observe a face down positioning for uh, 10 minutes per hour during days for seven days. So it was an ambispective, mostly prospective study, uh, but we lost for uh, three, pa three patients, so we introduced three patients retrospectively, and it was performed by myself and uh, Jacques Libert, who was my former head of department, and the uh, inclusion criteria were um, idiopathic epiretinal membranes, and best corrected visual acuity in logmar between 0.5 and 0.2, meaning in decimal between 0.3 and 0.6. And we had mostly pseudophagic patients or uh, rarely uh, young patients around uh, 40 years old who of course do not have any sign of cataract. Uh, clinical evaluation was performed with best corrected visual acuity and OCT before and up to four years after surgery. Uh, but particularly at one, three, six, and one year after surgery. And we performed the systematic ILM peeling using Brian Peel, Brian Lugie. Uh, we had two groups, a control group without gas, which we'll say uh, it was a normal group, and uh, a study group with 0.4 cc of pure SF6 gas. And we asked the patient to observe a phase down positioning for 10 minutes per hour during the days. And this gas bubble remained for approximately seven days after surgery as an average. So first of all, uh, as you can see here, we, it is uh, without gas group, the control group and the study group with gas. Um, Preoperatively, the groups were very comparable with uh, uh, a visual acuity of 0.4 in logmar and standard deviation which were very comparable. Uh, but after surgery, you can see here that in the gas group, visual acuity was definitely better than in the control group, first of all. And secondly, as you can see here, 
uh, standard deviation was almost the same in the gas group, whereas in uh, the control group, standard deviation after surgery raised a lot. And I think this standard deviation is one sign among others of trauma induced during surgery. So because we had comparable groups preoperatively, we could uh, perform, uh, we could measure the number of lines gained after surgery. And one year after surgery, in the uh, control group with, uh, without gas, our patients gained approximately 1.4 lines, whereas in the group with gas, it was 3.8 lines. Of course, it was statistically significant. Um, very briefly, we examined the distribution of uh, idiopathic epiretinal membranes in our group. So first of all, we had diffuse epiretinal membranes, cystoid macular edema, CME epiretinal membranes, pseudo, pseudo hole and lamellar hole. We put it in the same group because we consider that pseudo hole and lamellar hole are prob probably of the same origin. And we included vitro macular traction because it could be in macular hole studies or in uh, epiretinal membrane too. And in number of line gained, uh, of lines gained, sorry, um, I will say that uh, the diffuse group was statistically significant and we had a tendency for cystoid macular edema to be significant too. But in the PLH, in the pseudolamina hole group, there was absolutely no statistically significant result, meaning that, of course, and it has been shown in other uh, studies, uh, operating pseudo holes and lamella holes is uh, sometimes tricky and I'm still not sure, not convinced to, to that uh, this kind of patients need to be operated or not. Um, thereafter, we measured the ratio of postoperative over preoperative macular sickness by OCT, and uh, it means that with a ratio of one, uh, you didn't change the sickness of the retina. Uh, so if you reduced it, it means that you slightly reduce the sickness of your retina. And in the gas group, uh, reduction of the sickness was uh, uh, better than in the control group. But sometimes reduction of the sickness is also associated to uh, a thinning of the retina, and we need to be very careful with that. So just to show exactly the same results, uh, uh, in the diffuse group, we had the same results. In the CME group, uh, uh, we had a tendency, and in the PLH group, there was absolutely no uh, sign about that. So the next question is, uh, is gas injection ac associated to better final macular contour? So we asked two uh, surgeons to check on OCTs and uh, to say if uh, the macular contour by OCT was normal or abnormal, and as you can see here, in the uh, control group without gas, we had mostly uh, abnormal contours, whereas in the, con in the gas group, we had uh, frequently one year after surgery an almost normal uh, macular shape. So the next question was to know when to operate with gas. So we took two kind of patients, patients with a bad preoperative visual acuity, which mean uh, in decimal between 0.2 and 0.3, and people with a good preoperative visual acuity, which means in decimal between 0.6 uh, and 0.7 uh, visual acuity. And as you can see here, the bad visual acuity group is gaining more lines, and it has already been described in other studies because, of course, we are coming for uh, from uh, far away and we can raise even better if our visual acuity is very bad. But uh, when we focus on the next question, meaning what is the final visual acuity, uh, definitely in the bad group, the patient are not recovering totally, whereas in the good group, our patients are more prone to recover. In uh, the bad group, uh, our patients were recovering uh, 0.1 uh, logomar uh, visual acuity, and in the good group, our patients were even higher. And four years later, because we could uh, say, okay, at one year, we just uh, 
uh, speeds the recovery, but perhaps after that, in a few years later, uh, we will have the same results finally. But uh, four years later, we compared our results and in the gas group and uh, the, the control group, we had uh, al almost the same results. Of course, some patients lost vision, but uh, it was uh, more than 70 years old patient as an average. So in conclusion, uh, systematic gas injection at the end of surgery uh, is acting against trauma induced during a peeling. It uh, gives us a better uh, visual acuity, better results for gain of lines, better ratio of post-operative over pre-operative macular sickness. Uh, we have more normalized aspect. And I will say that I feel more comfortable operating patients earlier uh, and of course, these results are consistent with time. But it is, of course, small groups. Uh, nowadays, I already operated more than 1,000 patients with gas uh, in an observational study. Uh, and uh, few colleagues are nowadays uh, routinely injecting gas or air uh, with similar effects. So the next question to answer would be, uh, uh, is it better to inject gas or air? And I don't have, of course, any answer. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Philip. Any question from the floor? Please. I have a question. I'm Eva from Sweden. And I have a question. Why do you use a pure air, uh, gas bubble, 0 0.4 milliliters, instead of doing an air gas exchange? Uh, or uh, at the end? Quicker. Okay. I just in, uh, use uh, 0.4 cc of gas at the end of surgery, and the day after, it's uh, filling approximately 40% of the vitreous cavity the day after, approximately. Okay. Right. Meaning that uh, the day after, I'm still able to see the macular area. Uh, Philip, uh, I, we have done a similar study, but not prospective one as yours. So your results are much more reliable, of course, but uh, we have done a retrospective study and I was uh, always giving mostly uh, air at the end of the surgery just to have the effect of iron, mechanical ironing of the uh, fovea. Uh, and we, we uh, just uh, compared the results with air and without air group, so we couldn't get any uh, difference between the uh, visual results and the anatomical results. Uh, do you think this is because of the gas uh, for the, for a long time, or because be is this is because of the uh, retrospective nature of the study? Uh, I don't think it's due to the gas effect because uh, uh, one friend of mine from uh, Grenoble in France. Uh, uh, Pierre Albinet is uh, doing exactly the same since uh, I presented uh, my, my results uh, and uh, is using air. Uh, I will say that uh, I think uh, retrospectively it is not a good way to examine this because in fact everybody I think or most of us will inject some air or gas at the end of surgery when something goes wrong, you know, when you see that you're pulling on your retina when you are removing your ILM, naturally most of people will inject something because they say, oh, uh, it was not so good. So I think that retrospectively it's very hard. And uh, uh, that's why we were very, very, very difficult with our patients. We selected 61 patients over 300 patients at the beginning, removing a lot of patients. Some sign of cataract out, some, uh, some clues of uh, thrombosis out, uh, no, you don't have diabetes, but you you, uh, you are taking glucophage, okay, out, etc., etc., etc. You have some uh, diabetic patients in your uh, family, out, etc., etc., etc. So uh, it was very, uh, we were very strong with our patients. But nowadays with uh, almost 1,000 patients with just gas at, uh, at that time, always gas, I will say that these results are very uh, consistent. Uh, during this study, we just had one patient who did not recover a better visual acuity of a 30 in the group of g gas, but uh, I would say it's uh, more a ratio of two or three patients over 30 uh, nowadays, uh, but uh, definitely uh, we do not lose vision. 
I will say. The only cases that are tricky are uh, uveitis patients, uh, diabetic patients, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, because we have a sickening of the uh, epiretinal membrane. And one more question: Do you think uh, it will uh, the the gas is just making it uh, earlier, the, the changes earlier, or I mean, with time, do you think both groups will become together? The, the, the tendency is it is it like that, or uh, the difference will be just the same with time? What do you think about that? I think there is a tendency in my statistics to say that it's uh, coming quicker, but not so much. And this is why I finish with the, the idea of putting air, because Pierre Albinet from Grenoble is doing a lot of ILM peeling with air at the end of surgery, and he uh, definitely observes uh, a quicker response with air. So perhaps air is even better, okay? because we have oxygen, et cetera, et cetera, that is not bad for the retina somewhere. So perhaps it's a, a better idea, but actually I just used a SF6, a pure SF6, and uh, I'll No, I, ju I just meant, uh, do you think the, the group without gas will catch the uh, group with gas with time? I mean, visual acuity respect and foveal contour respect? Uh, no, uh, it was uh, one of our questions, and that's why we wanted to follow our patients up to four years after surgery to, to ensure that there was no, uh, finally, uh, no uh, uh, recovery of uh, the control group, and it was not the case. Thank you. Antonio? Yeah, very nice talk, Philippe. You know, I have been using air fluid exchange um, in all my cases of uh, macular Parker surgery from maybe 10 years. Like uh, uh, Steve Charles, when we started to do small gauge surgery, suggested that if you leave um, air in the vitreous cavity, there is less risk of uh, uh, leakage from the unsutured um, holes, 23 or 25 years. So the reason why I do air food exchange since then, it's my routine, is because I think that you have uh, less risk of hypotony and, and leakage if you leave the eye with air compared to fluid. And um, <coughs> uh, your, you know, your observation is very nice. I didn't do for this reason especially, but I always do air fluid exchange at the end of the case. Okay. Thank you. Any other question? Please. Yeah, I would like to ask if you do positioning the patient and do you think it's matter? Yeah, um, most of my patients for facility reasons are operated with uh, uh, a local anesthesia. Uh, so just after surgery, they are taking a coffee and uh, before they leave the, the clinic, so let's say 30 minutes after surgery, uh, we ask them to do their first face down positioning for 10 minutes. So uh, the nurse just checks that uh, everything is done properly and then the patient uh, can leave away. And I think it's the uh, first, uh, as, uh, as Sengul uh, mentioned, it is an ironing procedure, you know? You, you are removing a, a membrane that is pulling on your tissue and after that you are just ironing your tissue. And uh, I think that the quicker we do it is probably the better. Theoretically, I, I didn't examine this, but I think that uh, if we do it in the next minutes, uh, the first minutes, first uh, 30 minutes, it should be better than waiting uh, the day after and things like that. You still ask the patient to do face down after home a few, uh, one or two weeks afterwards? Because no, no, the no, gas bubble is Ju just the when eye. there is gas, so approximately it's remaining for one week and just during days, and uh, it's just uh, 10 minutes per hour, because uh, uh, first of all, uh, I'll say that I would be concerned about this pressure exerted on the macular area uh, with a small gas bubble, because uh, we know that if you are bleeding from your finger, you just compress here, okay? And that's nice, but if you continue like that for a few minutes or a few hours, I don't know wh what will happen, but perhaps we will get a necrosis, and perhaps it will not be as good as we could imagine. So if we consider that a heart attack is ac uh, acceptable for the first three minutes, 
uh, it's, uh, it's why I consider to, do, to say to my patients, uh, 10 minutes is good enough, uh, because I know they are not doing 10 minutes, but perhaps five or six minutes, because it's boring and uh, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, uh, the res results are not so bad, I'll say. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Any other question? Um, I think you, you are also advising patients uh, avoiding from uh, lay down positioning, probably. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, Jerry? Since we have a room of people interested in the vitreoretinal interface and these diseases that were very nicely covered by this symposium, I'd like to make a pitch for increasing the precision of the terminology that we use. Epimacular or epiretinal membrane is imprecise. What we're actually dealing with are premacular membranes. And so the acronym ERM should be replaced with PMM, a premacular membrane, as opposed to an epiretinal membrane. Furthermore, the disease is not ERM. The disease is macular pucker. And these membranes are very different from people who have macular pucker and people who have macular holes and people with diabetic macular edema, as we heard earlier. So we have to improve our terminology and break down our groups into pure groups based upon our thinking of the etiology and what we find histopathologically. And I think that your study would be very much strengthened if you did subgroup analysis. Now, I know the numbers get very small, but the biggest problem in my hands is the group of patients with a premacular membrane and macular pucker. Those are the people that often have swelling postoperatively after a perfect operation with no hemorrhages, and the membrane came off nicely, but the macula is still thickened. So if you can show that in that subgroup of individuals, including a gas bubble, decreases the thickness, that would be a very helpful thing for all of us to, to improve the patient's outcomes. And I saw that you used a ratio. Did you use a ratio as well as the absolute thickness of pre-op versus post-op? Why did you end up doing the ratio? I'm curious to know. I try, we tried to find uh, the foveal uh, area, and we just measured at the foveal place, foveolar place let's say it like that, measuring the foveolar uh, area, uh, foveolar sickness, preoperatively and postoperatively. But if you use the absolute numbers, were the results the same? Uh, I don't know, we didn't do, do it, but uh, uh, we are actually uh, examining this uh, 1,000 patients uh, uh, because it's an observational prospective study somewhere, and uh, we are trying to, to re-examine everything we're trying to understand because uh, in this group of patients, we have diabetic patients, we have uh, every kind of, uh, of pathologies, uh, and uh, we will try to figure out uh, some uh, statistical uh, informations, but uh, let's say that my uh, uh, assistants are a bit uh, working a lot, of, let's say like that. But definitely you are true to say that we need to get a, a good uh, terminology, but. In my mind, uh, I know most of people are nowadays using macular pucker, but uh, I'm not very confident with macular pucker, pucker because uh, in the 1980s, uh, some surgeons uh, used macular pucker for epiretinal membranes with a hole in the periphery or epiretinal membrane following retinal detachment. And in these specific cases, I think it's a totally different case. I will uh, put this case in a, a sort of PVR group, you know. You're so absolutely right. I, I totally agree with you that we, our termi terminology is not good at all, but we, we should sit down and think uh, how to figure out a good terminology to publish something and say, this is what we sh need to, to use as a standard for, uh, for defining our pathologies. Correct, and linked to pathophysiology, or as best as we understand pathophysiology, including yeah. anomalous posterior vitreous detachment and vitreoschesis, which I think is another aspect that needs to be looked at as a subgroup analysis, presence or absence of vitreoschesis. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Thank you, Jerry, for especially warning us about uh, terminology. And I think there are many unknown things still uh, considering the premacular membranes. Um, because after surgery, some of them are, the foveal contour is not normal, but you have the full vision. And some of them are just normal, uh, get normal contour, but the vision is stays you know, still low. So we should, I think, do some more studies on these uh, aspects if they have any other considerations. Thank you. Would you like to conclude the uh, session? Yes, please. Uh, so I will just uh, say a few words to try to conclude this uh, session. First of all, um, ILM peeling is uh, preferable to posterior yellowhead removal to try to avoid recurrences uh, due to ILM contraction after surgery, and it allows uh, the best recovery as possible. Um, however, peeling the ILM is traumatizing the underlying ganglion cell bundles, but there is some ways to reduce the trauma uh, we induce as we saw uh, today, and many different pathologies could benefit from it. Uh, either idiopathic macular pucker or epiretinal membranes, uh, secondary epiretinal membranes, uh, primary macular holes or complex or recurrent macular holes as an example. Um, as an example, the classic and inverted flap technique presented by Zofia uh, allowed grit enhancement in macular hole closure and I trust her because I'm doing it uh, routinely nowadays. Particularly the temporal inverted flap technique would be really interesting by avoiding to peel the ILM in the maculopapillary bundle. Of course, the free flap technique is interesting in complex situations, but would become another interesting procedure to avoid peeling the ILM over the macular area. Some studies even dig, uh, even dig further inside OCT details to try to predict surgical outcomes. In their article, Seidel et al. showed that remnants of ILM are still present on the retinal surface in almost 50% of cases. And it is extremely important because it could explain some recurrences that some groups worldwide are observing in their uh, in their studies. They demonstrated two conditions to be uh, associated with a persistent ILM. First one is a sickening of the epiretinal membrane, and second one is when the epiretinal membrane is elevated over the retinal surface. In such cases, you should take again your dye, your vital dye, to color again your retina, because frequently you will find a second membrane. But one weakness of this study is that the team was staining his retina using ICG, and I, will, I would recommend to use Brian Blue G because, of course, it's not as good to color the, the membranes, but uh, with Brian Blue G, you are coloring astrocytes, and uh, those you are uh, probably not missing uh, membranes. Shields and all uh, found that better postoperative visual acuity was associated with uh, the presence of preoperative retinal contraction, like here, and of a lower preoperative maximal retinal sickness. So, in such cases, with a retinal contraction and a, 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 a lower uh, maximal retinal sickness, your patient should recover a better visual acuity. So. It means somewhere that we don't need to wait a uh, too long time. In the same way, they showed that preoperative uh, foveal ellipsoid zone attenuation, like here, as you can see, we have an attenuation of ellipsoid uh, area, or even ellipsoid absence. In such cases, also, your patient will recover properly. But as they said in their article, uh, pseudo holes are not associated with visual acuity enhancement. So, as a conclusion, be aware of uh, possible trauma when peeling the ILM. Particularly, be careful with light toxicity. I'm working with the slit lamp. It's an old technique somewhere, but 
it, gi it gives me precision when I'm uh, operating my patients. And I will say that I'm uh, forgetting light toxicity because I'm as far as possible uh, from my eye. Uh, be careful with dye toxicity, with ICG, with uh, uh, any other dye. And as we already said, of course, please start temporarily to the macula to try to uh, induce as least as possible uh, trauma. Um, if you want, if, if you have uh, the possibility, please try the flap technique in macular hole sur surgery or, of course, the free technique. And uh, in some cases, uh, try uh, to inject some gas or some air at the end of epiretinal membrane peelings. Of course, please continue to be uh, aware of this uh, phenomenon and try to recognize early prognostic signs of to operate early if possible and if needed uh, your patients. Thank you very much for your attention.